Exterior coffee house, night. When you were a kid, didn't you think we were meant to live this grand adventure? Interior coffee house, continuous. Nick and Pedro sit across from each other at a table. Who would have thought that we'd end up here? And in suits. Pedro leans in. Yeah. I feel like I'm living the most boring story ever written. Is this how life was really supposed to play out? Honestly, I get through it just knowing... Knowing... Nick pauses, searching for the words to say. <sighs> Line! Cut! The line is... I get through it knowing that I'm awesome. I've always been awesome, and each day more awesome than the last. Crushing it, always crushing it, continuing to be awesome, and again, further crushing it. I get through it knowing that. Honestly, I just don't think that's my character. Can I try something else? Let me think. Yes, I love it. Let's do it. It's great, but we're gonna have to change the ending. It's gonna be a major rewrite. We're doing it. Places, everyone. Camera back to one. Camera. Speeding. Sound. Speeding. Marker. Nick's life. Scene 27. Take two. Action. Yeah. I do feel that way sometimes. And then, I think about this verse that's always stuck in my head. Welcome to National Community Church, all eight of our campuses. This weekend, we continue the series called Script. Over time, your favorite scripture becomes the script of your life. Well, I've asked some of our staff members, and we've got an all-star team, uh, to share their life verse, their script. And so this weekend, we have got former Washington Redskin and now campus pastor, here at National Community Church, Pastor Joshua Simonette from our Kingstown campus uh, to come and share with us. He's a gifted leader, gifted teacher. I know you're gonna be blessed and challenged this weekend, so would you give a huge welcome at all campuses to Pastor Joshua Simonette. So honored and humbled to be sharing with you this weekend, or uh, yeah, this weekend. Um, I guess I'm kind of coming off the bench for uh, the teaching team, pinch hitting a little bit. So excited about that. Hey, I have to shout out uh, my folks out in Kingstown, the great metropolis of Kingstown, <laughs> in the far, far away land of Kingstown. Listen, I'm with you guys. I'm with you. I love you. Um, during this series, you will hear us uh, refer to the Bible as the script. So if you have your script with you this weekend, why don't you turn with me to uh, Joshua chapter number one. Yeah. And we'll start at verse number one. And will you do me a favor? Will you stand for the reading of God's word? It's a way for us to honor our God through his word. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you 
nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. You may be seated. Well, during the summer between my freshman and sophomore year in college, I made a little decision that really didn't make a whole lot of sense at the time. Um, I had an athletic scholarship to uh, the football powerhouse Tennessee Technological University, (laughs) which uh, many of you may not have heard of before because it is not a powerhouse. Um, As you can quite imagine, uh, Tennessee Tech is more known for producing engineers and not necessarily professional athletes. But of the options that I had uh, as a senior in high school, um, I I thought that Tennessee Tech would be the place where I could pursue my dream uh, to go to the NFL. Now, my high school counselor, uh, Ms. Mears, uh, man, she thought that might have been one of the dumbest decisions she's ever heard. Um, because I was turning down potential appointments to West Point and the Air Force Academy to go to Tennessee Tech. Go figure. And um, the crazy part about it was there was something in my gut. I had a vision that this was the place that I was supposed to go to, and, and this is the decision that I was supposed to make. So I trusted my gut. So uh, coming into my... my, my uh, my, my sophomore year, I uh, decided that I wanted to remind myself of, of the place that I chose, Tennessee Tech, and why I chose it, uh, a place that hadn't produced an NFL player since, I think, uh, the early or mid-'80s uh, prior to my arrival in 1996. So this little decision, I decided that I was going to wear a suit to every single game. Um, now, that might seem insignificant, to you, but, but it was a way for me to start preparing for where I envisioned that I would go. It, it was an opportunity for me to clothe myself for where I thought I would be. See, I, I noticed the NFL players were, were, would show up to the games and they would be dressed in their suits and, and their post-game conferences. They would be looking real dapper, you know, and smooth with their, with their coats on and their hats. And so I said, you know what? I, I, I need to do the same thing. Um, but, 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 but here's, here's, here's the thing. It, this, this was pretty ridiculous uh, in terms of this decision that I was making because, I mean, one, this wasn't the NFL. And then, number two, this was Tennessee Tech. I mean, like, you know, and, and let me just put it into context for some of you. I went to school at the same time uh, as Peyton Manning, who was playing at the University of Tennessee, which was right down the road in Knoxville. So whenever they, they had home games, you can rest assured nobody was at our games. <laughs> I mean, you know, we were showing up to the stadium and it was just our parents and a few folks who couldn't get a ride home that weekend, you know? <laughs> Nobody really cared about our games. Um, and, and so for me to, to, to put this suit on like, like I was at Auburn and I was going to take a ceremonial walk across the, 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 the campus in the, the, the famous Tiger Walk, I mean, it was completely ridiculous. I put my suit on in my dorm room, walked five minutes across an empty school parking lot. Uh-huh took my suit off, and then got ready to play a game in front of my parents. That... <laughs> but, but I repeated this ritual. I repeated this ritual, this little ridiculous thing for three years. Every, see, and I only had two suits, so I was just rotating, you know. <laughs> got me a couple of ties, it got creative, you know. But, but I repeated this for, for three years, and it, it made no sense to my teammates. Probably didn't make any sense to my coaches. Um, Who did I think I was? Where did I think I was? Did I really think I had an opportunity to go to the NFL from Tennessee Tech? Well, the truth of the matter is I didn't know. 
but I was going to get ready and find out. I was going to give myself a shot. See, I had a vision. So it didn't matter what anybody else said. It didn't matter what anybody else thought. If I look ridiculous doing it, so be it. But I had a vision. Early on in my life, I became fascinated with the character of Joshua in the Bible. Um, one, because it's my name. Um, but, but I gravitated towards this story of Joshua and his, his leadership leading the children into this uh, promised land. And, and so I think over time, I felt uh, um, the need to live up to this, to this name, to carry on this tradition of, of leadership, leading people into previously unknown territory, maybe even leading myself into previously unknown territory. Now, no one put this pressure on me. I just think over time, uh, it evolved. And so I, I've, I've always found myself in these, these unfamiliar places, in this unchar- uncharted territory, probably places that I had no business being in. And I can see the same kind of pattern being reflected in Joshua's life in, in Scripture. But in order for us to fully understand what we just read in Joshua chapter 1, these, these first nine verses, um, there, there, there are a couple of things that I want us to understand, all right? So number one, uh, Joshua is succeeding Moses, all right? He's arguably the quintessential figure of the Old Testament. Yeah. Now, this isn't sports center, so I'm not comparing uh, Moses' game to Elijah or Abraham or I'm not doing Listen, as, as a matter of fact, I'm just echoing what uh, the Scripture tells us. If, if you just back up one chapter in, into Deuteronomy right before Joshua 1, li- listen, listen to what it says. It says, uh, no one prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, who God knew face to face. And no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of Israel. So... Joshua is kind of under a little bit of pressure here, following Moses. And he's under uh, a pressure as well because now he's leading them into this promised land that everyone knows about and everyone has heard about. Second thing we need to consider is Joshua has already envisioned this happening 38 years ago. So, so, so he's replayed this moment in his mind For 38 years. So if we hit the rewind button and go back to Numbers uh, 13, we we will see the account, but I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. Um, Moses sends 12 spies, all right, one from each tribe to go check out Canaan, all right, to bring back a report. And and now keep in mind, Canaan is already promised. God said, I'm going to give it to you. So this was an exploratory uh, mission. They're just going to check it out, just going to see what's up, all right? So, so, uh, of the 12, only two came back and gave a positive report. That would be Joshua and Caleb. The other 10 said, man, listen, the folks in that land, they big, man. <laughs> they big, they strong, and uh, I don't know that we can overpower them. And, and everybody got scared. I mean, like, it was, it was a problem. It was a huge problem. It, the, in Numbers 13, it says, and then you go over in the, into chapter 14, it says, the people just tore their clothes and they wept and they said, why in the world would God send us to this land with these strong people? What in the world? We should find us a leader and go back to Egypt because that was comfortable for them. That's what they knew. But then Joshua and Caleb, matter of fact, it was Caleb. Caleb got real gangsta on them. He said, hold up. Y'all need to chill out. We, we can take these fools. We need to go up and attack them. And the people said, we can't do it. See, there were grapes in this land that were so big that two people had to carry a cluster between a pole. They had never eaten anything like this in their life. They said, surely this is the land that is flowing with milk and honey, but there are also giants. If, you, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. There's no great opportunity without giant opposition. For the slow note takers, I'm going to say it again. There's no great opportunity 
without any giant opposition. See, you've always got a choice to focus on the grapes, the things that you've never experienced before, a life you've never lived before, opportunities you've never seen. You've always got the opportunity to focus on the grapes, and you always got the opportunity to focus on the giants. But you've got to pick one. You've got to choose one. Now, research suggests that what you focus on influences your outcome. Duh, we don't need research for that. But then there's a book, New York Times bestseller, The Power of Habit, says that belief is an integral part of success. Listen to what it says. Belief is essential, and it grows out of a communal experience, even if that community is only, only as large as two people. See, that's why who you roll with matters. That's why who's in your crew matters. That's why your friends matter. The people who have influence in your life matter. And we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. See, sometimes we just need one person to believe in us. Or we just need one person to see what we see so we know we're not crazy. But, but, but here's the thing. See, see Joshua and Caleb, they, they didn't need research. They didn't need a New York Times bestseller. They didn't need 100 likes on Instagram. They read the script. So, so they knew that it was promised to them. They, they knew that this was given to them. They knew how the story ended. So that means that the giants that everybody was tripping about, oh, they, they, they just a part of the story to make it interesting. You know, just, just a, little, a little action, a little drama, a little intrigue. Because, see, here's, here's the thing. If God promised the grapes, then he got to deal with the giants. If there are grapes of an opportunity, things that we've never experienced before, but they're also giant. If God promised it, he, he's going to work it out because he promised it. Now, here's, here's the thing. I, I majored in English at Tennessee Tech, so go figure. Uh, Tennessee Tech, you know, engineer, science, and then I majored in English. You know, I, I clearly had my own agenda. Um, <laughs> so I'm not that great at math, but, but, but if, if, if you take two out of 12, it's about 17%, all right? Um, my iPhone calculator helped me out, all right? <laughs> but it makes me wonder about the other 83%. And I wonder if that 83% reflects the percentage of us who make decisions based on the giant odds against us instead of the odds that are written in the script. As opposed to what God has promised us in the script. See, if you're taking notes, don't edit yourself out of what you've already been promised in the script. I'm going to say it again. (laughs) Don't edit yourself out of what has already been promised in the script. Now, that's if you have read the script. That's if you know the script. That is if you are digesting the script. You got to know how it's going to end. Now, the script is, it's like the game plan. You know, it's, it's given to you by a coach, all right? So, so, so Moses, in this instance, all right, uh, is essentially the, the head coach uh, of, of Israel at the time that they're exploring this land. And so, so he is the disseminator of the game plan. The game plan is given to him uh, by God. And so he, he, God essentially says to, to Moses, all right, send 12 men to go explore what I am giving to them. I'm giving it to them. Just go check it out. Just go dream, you know, see where you're going to put your house, you know, what the land is going to look like. Just, just go check it out. Don't worry about who's already there. Just go check it out. It was a promise. Now, see, in my life, all right, um, I've had several coaches, you know, several game plans and, you know, just, just over my life of playing ball. But no greater coaches than my parents. You know, they, they, they started teaching me the game plan early. They, they, they started schooling me about these promises that, that God had, had, had given to me. But see, my parents couldn't be more different. You know, my mom is, she's really kind of like Vince Lombardi, you know. I mean, just the disciplinarian, the enforcer, you know, just talk to you real strong, you know. Um, boy, did I tell you that God is on your side. 
So why are you complaining? What are you crying about? You better go pray. You know, in the black community, we talk to our kids that way, you know, so. Little, little strong, little abrasive, you know, but that, that's, that's, that's just, that's what we do. But my dad, my dad was real cool, you know, completely different. He was more like Yoda, you know. He, 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 he's more the, the, you know, the, the, mental, uh, the mental coach, you know. Uh, very cerebral, you know, would, would say things. Was always repeating like movie stuff and cartoon stuff to, to, to get me to think about Scripture. It, it, was, it was really, son, you, you know why that happened, right? The force is with you. Because the Holy Spirit has come to lead you and guide you into all truth. I'm like, yeah, Pop, all right. You know, I'm, I'm like seven, you know. <laughs> or or, or here, I, I love uh, um, G.I. Joe, you know, uh, and at the end they would say knowing is half the battle, you know. And so he, my dad, son, knowing is half the battle. You got to know what the word says. If you don't know it, then you, you already, uh, you out of luck already. But everything I did, every goal, you know, I pursued, they reinforced with the game plan. And I just want to put a pin right here and just challenge the parents because that is the role that you play in your kids' lives. You are their Moses. You are their head coach. You're telling them to go and possess what God has promised them. But that requires you as parents to know the game plan in order to disseminate it to your kids. Because what you say, they can become. So I decided to wear this suit before every game because my parents, they kept reinforcing the game plan. They, they reminded me that these ridiculous things that I was chasing, I don't even know if they thought it was ridiculous or not, but they never said so. But they reminded me that these things, with God, it was possible. And they showed me who I was in the script, in the game plan. And at some point, I remember my dad telling me, son, I named you Joshua for a reason. And so over time, this, this, this repetitive phrase that we see in Joshua chapter 1, be strong and courageous, became my mantra. And it was those words that helped me stay focused on the great of, of the NFL when uh, it was after my career had ended at Tennessee Tech and it was the winter time and I didn't have uh, any scouts uh, trying to, to um, come and work me out. I didn't have an agent. Um, I, I didn't have any resources to do anything about it, but I decided that I was going to work out and prepare for what I had envisioned just in case. And I got one shot with one team seemingly out of nowhere and I was ready to capitalize. And I don't think it started then. I think it started when I decided I was going to wear that suit. In the book of Joshua, chapter 1, Joshua is on the cusp of what he's envisioned for 38 years. Now, let me just say, 38 years is a long time. So if you've been waiting like 3.8 months, just, <laughs> you know, just, just sit, sit tight, you know, just, just sit tight, all right? But, but, but Joshua is ready to capitalize. It's been 38 years. And so God is giving him these final uh, instructions as the new leader of Israel. He says uh, in verse 9, have I not commanded you, which has, has been my life verse my, my whole life. He says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. But I realized over time that that verse, verse number nine, my life verse, it was really tethered to verses seven and eight. It says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law, the script. My servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law, the script. Always on your lips, meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Last week, Pastor Mark gave us uh, three points. Um, so I'm just going to borrow those same three points. 
because I think it fits exactly. It is the exact formula that God has given to Joshua. Number one, keep this book of the law always on your lips. That is reading the script. Point number one. Number two, meditate on it day and night. That is researching the script. All right? Point number three, be careful to do everything written in it. That is rehearsing the script. That is the formula. Seemingly very, very simple. All right? Then you will be prosperous if you do these things and successful. All right? Okay, cool. Got it. That was simple enough. But then we get to verse 9, and there's an extra push, and there's this, this confrontational tone. He says, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I'm having flashbacks of my mother. <laughs> this strong conversational, I'm like, yo, you said it three times already. Yeah. I heard you. So I asked myself, why such strong emphasis and repetition? And I had the same kind of question about Psalm 23, specifically verse 2, where David is talking about God as the shepherd and, 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 the, and we as the sheep. And in verse 2, he says uh, that, that he makes me lie down in green pastures. So, okay, if all I need to do is read the script, research it, rehearse it. All right, we got that, Joshua 1.8. And... In Psalm 23, too, if, if, if God is leading me to the green pastures, which probably means that it's good to eat there, then, then why does he have to command Joshua, and why does he have to make the sheep lie down? And see, I, I think that there are several reasons for that, but, but there's one main one that I wanted to highlight. See, I think God knows that the only thing that will make us deviate from the script is fear. See, we have the formula, but fear is still present. He knows that when the times get tough, when it's actually time to execute the plan, when it's actually time to face the giants, that's when fear can kick in. So he's reminding Joshua because Remember, the children of Israel had a tendency to retreat. They, they, they even said we wanted to go back to where we came from, which was slavery. So he knows their tendency. So he's, he's reminding them. But then the, the correlation to Psalm 23 and 2 uh, is this. See, sheep only have one main defense, and it's to run. So they would rather stand in position, all right, so that they can be ready to run in case of fear instead of being patient and trusting and waiting on the shepherd, believing that he would protect them. So he has to make the sheep lie down. He has to assure them that he is there with them, which is why Joshua's instructions conclude with God saying, I will be with you wherever you go. See, God knows that Joshua doesn't have the ability to be strong and courageous on his own. See, he, he, he wants Joshua to have confidence in the fact that he is with him. Let me break it down to you as uh, Pastor Eric Mason would say, street terms. He ain't going to break up with you. He with you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to walk out on you. Let me give you some, maybe some Capitol Hill terms. He won't veto his own legislation. <laughs> some military terms. He, he won't abort the mission. He's with you. He won't divorce you. He won't walk out on you when it gets tough. 
he is with you. And as a matter of fact, not only is he with you, but he's going to keep pushing you because he wants you to get where he envisions you more than you want to get there yourself. Reminds me of a story of a athlete. Her name was Kayla Montgomery, and in 2009, she was a high school freshman soccer player, a great promise. And one day she fell while she was playing and noticed that once she got home that she had tingling in her feet. She was beginning to lose feeling in her legs. And after several rounds of tests, doctors trying to figure out, you know, what is going on, uh, it was concluded that she had multiple, multiple sclerosis, MS. So she, she lost feeling uh, in her legs for several months, and then uh, she was no longer able to play soccer. Uh, and then after months of, of medication, she was able to get feeling back in her legs, and it, and it returned, and so did her desire to compete. So she decided that she was going to become a cross-country runner. Go figure. But there are two problems with this decision. She was a slow runner, all right, so she wasn't even good. But then the MS, all right, caused her to lose feeling in her legs as her body would heat up. So as she would begin to run, the more she ran, the less feeling she would have uh, in her legs. So with no sensation in her legs mid-race, she doesn't know how fast or slow she's going in a sport where you have to pace yourself. And so at the end of the race, she's completely lost feeling in her lower extremities. She doesn't even have the ability to stop herself without collapsing. But she had a coach. She had a coach that promised to push her and be with her wherever she went. And he would be at the finish line to catch her so that she could uh, stop running safely. The coach could be heard in Kayla's uh, racing from the stands. Then he would move down from the stands as the race would go on and he would be on the field. And then uh, as she turned the corner for the last 100 meters, he would be at the finish line there waiting to catch her to say, kid, I got you. You've got a heavenly father who cares for you, who's there with you, who's, who's pursuing you and pushing you into where he envisions you going. Kayla went on to become the North Carolina a state champion in cross country, breaking the school record. She wasn't even fast, but she had a vision. And she didn't let this giant opposition of MS slow her down from what she envisioned for her life. Listen, I just stopped by to tell somebody that God is with you. He is there with you, just like Kayla's coach. Because no matter the situation that you find yourself in, no matter the circumstance, You've got to know that God is with it. As a matter of fact, it's written in the script. If we go all the way back, it's a, it's, as a matter of fact, it's the theme in the entire script that he's with you. You can start at Genesis with Joseph who had a vision. God was with him. You can go to Moses, and, and, and he had a vision to lead his people out of slavery. God was with him. You can go to Esther, and Esther said, hey, listen, no matter what happens, I am going to put myself on the line for my people. God was with him. And then my favorite, David. David was just so smooth and so cool. David said, hey, listen, King, I'm going to go kill this giant, but I'm going to do it with five rocks in my pocket. Watch me do it. <laughs> God was with him. Then we fast forward all the way to the New Testament. God is so crazy about us, and he wants to reconcile himself to us. He sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross, to settle this thing once and for all so that we can reign with him forever. That's how the script ends. So you got to know that at the end of the day, we win. And this whole thing is not about just us trying to be strong and courageous in our own strength. It's about trusting who is with us because we're going to fall because we're going to get discouraged, 
But we got to remind ourselves of who is with us, and we've got to trust him. It's, our, it's God's job to be in position. It's our job to trust him. Let's pray. God, I just thank you so much for how much you love us, for how much you care for us. And God, I'm thankful for this reminder that you are with us. I know that there are some who are struggling right now and maybe have been pursuing something for a very long time and they're tired. They're saying, I'm tired of being strong. I'm tired of being courageous. But God, help them to lean and depend only on you because sometimes we just try to do too much. Sometimes we're trying to do it in our own strength and we're getting in the way. But God, remind us like you reminded Joshua, even command us if you have to, because we, Lord knows we can be hard-headed. Let us know that you are with us every place that we go. And if we follow the script, we will prosper and be successful. In Jesus' name, amen.